Okay, colleagues. Thanks for coming back, and I am delighted to welcome you to our final Frith Prize lecture this morning. And so I'd like to introduce Motaz Assam, who's from the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. So Motaz's thesis used methods from the Human Connectome Project to define the exact cortical layout of the multiple demand circuit. Progress in understanding this circuit has been slow because of the low resolution of fMRI. Motaz's nomination referred to his work as, quote, technically fearless, that it, quote, dramatically improved our knowledge of the anatomical localization of the multiple demand network, and that his work is, quote, set to become the world standard. So I understand that he has also been quite involved in building neuroscience capacity in his home country of Egypt and has exciting aspirations in this respect. And if we don't hear about it during the talk, I hope we'll hear about it during dinner. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Um, yeah. I've heard that uh, our speaker likes the audience to be ruthless, so that's, a, that's an invitation <laughs> for the question period. Um, but we're really looking forward to what you have to say to us. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Um, um, thanks, thanks again for this generous introduction, and um, hi everyone. This is actually my first uh, EPS experience ever, and uh, I've been very impressed by what I've seen, um, so, and I hope you'll enjoy this talk. Um, I'd like to also thank the EPS committee for, for this award. Um, it's an honor to receive it. And um, in this talk, I'll hopefully show you the first steps of what we think how the um, distributed brain activity gives rise to organized uh, cognition. Um, okay. So um, I'll first start by uh, describing the theoretical framework uh, which is guiding us on how to look for activity in the brain and then I'll dive deep into which brain regions we think are relevant to this theoretical framework and how they um, interact together. So the uh, main uh, question that is uh, driving our uh, theoretical framework is this. Is, is there a core function behind uh, Spearman's G or the general intelligence factor? Um, and as you may know, um, uh, G was uh, motivated by the finding of uh, positive correlations between uh, lots of different cognitive tests. Right? So in other words, um, some people tend to perform well in very different tasks, for example. Um, but there are a specific type of tasks that correlate most strongly with, with G. And these are usually the ones that involve novel problem solving, like these um, Raven uh, progressive matrices. So in, in this experiment, um, the participants were asked to fill in the missing matrix by drawing their answer in the response box below. And I'm sure if I give you enough time, you'll be able to figure out that the answer is something like this. And we know that uh, uh, performance on such a task um, correlates with um, um, IQ, or uh, which is a proxy for measuring G. So as you can see here with the blue dots, let me get this. Uh, can you see the laser? Yeah. So as you can see here with the blue dots, so people who um, have a um, higher IQ score tend to perform better on these uh, uh, tasks, right? But what about people who find this task challenging? Um, so what if um, we decide to divide, make the task a little bit more simpler for them. So we ask them to just solve now this simple um, uh, step in the task. Uh, for example, where should they draw the vertical line? And they uh, would figure that the vertical line should be in the middle. And then um, is the arrow pointing to the right or to the left? Um, so they should figure out that it's pointing to the left. And then is the left end of the um, uh, of the a vertical line here <clears throat> should remain the same or should, or should it change and they would figure out that it should um, remain the same. Right? And if you give this um, segmented form of the task to the same participants, um, they tend to perform well here um, regardless of their IQ score um, as you can see here by the, by the red dots. So what this points to is that there is um, um, uh, dividing this uh, complex problem into its simpler steps uh, is, uh, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a 
cognitive function that is related to IQ somehow, right? So let's, let's um, look at what does it mean to divide uh, this into simpler steps using a simpler example. Think about the um, hypothetical example that you want to travel to Japan. And then you ask yourself, um, what should I do with my right hand now? And uh, that's a very big leap that there are lots of, um, that's very unconstrained to be able to solve it. But if you start to divide that problem of traveling to Japan into its intermediate steps, so for example, you say, okay, to travel to Japan, I need to fly. And then to fly, I need to buy a plane ticket. So I need to access a website. And to access a website, I need to use a mouse. And then you're able to answer the question of, okay, I'll use my right hand to move the mouse. Right? So. On the right here, the, this is a schematic of how we think the problem is divided into steps. But what does it mean to really create a step for that problem? It means that you need to link or integrate the relevant ingredients of that step together. Um, in other words, uh, we, 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 uh, we like to call it that you create or assemble a cognitive structure or a computational structure for how that step should look like. Um, so you focus on the relevant ingredients here. For example, you focus on the idea that you're traveling to Japan with the memory that Japan is far, so you need to uh, fly, so, um, uh, which leads you to the next sub-goal, which is uh, booking a, a plane ticket. So you focus on this step, and once you're done with it, you disassemble it, and then when you move to another step, you focus on that, um, the relevant ingredients for that other step. For example, here, how to use the mouse, uh, seeing the website on the screen, and how to uh, perform an action with your hand. And if you think about it, this, this um, lens of creating, assembling cognitive structures and then disassembling it um, can apply to all aspects of cognition, not just to um, solving Raven matrices, basically. So this is our guiding framework. How do we um, look into the brain for, for such a cognitive structure uh, uh, assembler? And there are lots of ways to, to, to look for, for such a, um, a system. Uh, but in this talk, I'll focus on using functional MRI. Um, in, in my thesis, there's a, a chapter on um, how we look at that system using invasive electrophysiology in humans, but um, there was no time to add it to the talk. Uh, but happy to talk about it later if you're interested. Um, yeah, so um, how do we look at that in uh, functional MRI? Um, usually, uh, what has been standard in the field is to contrast, um, 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 give participant a task, and uh, it has an easy version and the hard version, and contrast the hard minus the easy version. Could, the easy version could be anything, even just a fixation baseline, basically. Um, and the logic here is that um, as you give a participant a hard task, then this cognitive structural assembler is linking more ingredients together, so it's working harder. And by using that contrast, you're able to look at uh, um, which brain areas are related to linking these ingredients together. Um, so here I'm highlighting um, one um, great study by the Federenko team at MIT um, where they um, um, had the same subjects do seven tasks um, ranging from spatial or verbal working memory to response inhibition to just reading some non-words versus words. And all of these diverse tasks uh, seem to converge on uh, a specific set of brain areas, as you can see here. Some are present in the lateral frontal and lateral parietal regions, um, and um, some are present on the medial surface. Here again, medial frontal and medial parietal. Um, so uh, my supervisor, John Duncan, coined the term um, uh, for, for these regions called the multiple man system over a decade ago. Uh, but you might have also heard about them in the, uh, using terms like task positive, cognitive control, or attention networks, for example. They, in, in my view, they all refer to the same thing. Um, so what about fluid intelligent tasks? So if you give participants um, uh, Raven progressive matrices like the ones I've shown you before, and indeed um, using one of the largest samples probably present uh, that is unpublished from the CAMCAN data we have at CBU, um, uh, you do indeed find that uh, a hard versus easy uh, fluid intelligence task shows you similar regions in the frontal and parietal lateral surfaces and also in the medial surfaces. But note that there are some slight differences between these two maps, and this will be important later in the, in the talk. 
Um, and we also know that uh, if these multiple demand regions are damaged, uh, for example, due to stroke, then um, um, uh, the participants or the patients uh, um, lose lots of IQ points. Um, but this damage and the IQ relation is um, selective to the um, multiple demand regions. So if you use a control uh, set of regions like the language network here, then there is no relation between how much of the language network is damaged and uh, um, uh, the loss in IQ scores. So despite all of this evidence, uh, there's yet no consensus on the exact location of these regions, which seem to be very important to, um, to, to uh, lots of different cognitive tasks. So, uh, we know is that, that some of them are present, for example, in the middle frontal gyrus, some are the intraparietal sulcus, and some in the anterior cingulate cortex, but we don't really have a precise idea of where these are exactly located, because these regions are full of heterogeneous um, uh, areas. Um, and if you also speak to um, hardcore anatomists, um, they will tell you that domain general regions or multiple man regions don't really exist. Um, the, the, the brain doesn't uh, have uh, um, um, just domain general regions. They, it's full of uh, very specific regions. Each, each patch of the brain is doing a specific function, right? So this is an important challenge that, to this idea of the existence of a multiple demand system. And also we don't know much about their connectivity profile, so how they relate to the bigger brain networks like the default mode network or like the front parietal network, the, the dorsal attention, etc. So these were all unknowns. And we realized that uh, to answer these questions, um, the, the current way of doing brain imaging is quite limited in its spatial resolution to be able to to, to give us satisfactory answers, right? So we turn to the um, uh, human connectome project uh, approach, or the ACP approach. And this approach offers much higher spatial resolution, um, approximately three times better um, in, in the way uh, we localize brain activity. And this is due to lots of reasons. They, they it took them a few years to develop these methods. But there are two key criteria here that helped achieve this spatial resolution. First, the methods respect cortical geometry, so uh, they use surface-based approaches instead of analyzing their data in volumetric space. And also, when uh, in brain imaging we try to align brains together, we traditionally uh, depend on curvature, like using uh, this sulcus is in the same location as that sulcus in, in two participants, so we align them together. But we know now from empirical data that these uh, curvature patterns are um, uh, inconsistent and unstable, even between twins. So the HCP uh, used more stable neurobiological and multimodal features like myelin maps and uh, resting state connectivity maps. And the second uh, uh, thing that this approach offers is that we can interpret our results against a, a neurobiologically uh, motivated parcellation. So um, they divided the cortex into 180 regions per hemisphere, and each border uh, here was defined using multimodal criteria, so changes in myelin content or changes in cortical thickness, um, changes in, in task activations or changes in connectivity. Um, so, keeping that in mind, we, uh, we, we first decided to use the uh, uh, data from the Human Connectome Project da uh, database, which had hundreds of subjects. So, we, st we started our first experiment by selecting about uh, 400 plus subjects. And um, um, each of them did um, uh, seven tasks, but we selected the three uh, highlighted here, um, uh, which are relevant to, to um, what we're asking. So they did a working memory task, which was an N-back task. It was a two-back versus zero-back. They did a reasoning task, uh, which had an easy and the hard version, where they had to decide whether some abstract shapes are similar or uh, dissimilar in, uh, according to some features. And there was a, a math versus story task. And this last one was presented using um, auditory presentation, uh, where they were listening to some math equations and trying to solve it, versus listening to some stories and answering questions about the uh, stories. Um, so when we averaged the brain activity of um, um, these 400 plus uh, subjects for these three tasks, we could uh, delineate uh, nine patches across the whole cortex. So you can see that there is uh, five of them in the lateral frontal cortex. There's one here in the vicinity of the intraparietal sulcus. Um, there is a temporal patch which was uh, quite striking for us, it was present more anterior than previous 
um, uh, data would suggest. And there are two patches here on the medial and uh, frontal and parietal surfaces. So this is already quite uh, a, a much better spatial resolution of delineating these patches than uh, previous studies. Then we asked how do these patches relate to um, uh, the, the, the cortical parcellation, the 180 regions. And we found that uh, they relate to the conjunction of the significant areas uh, for each of these tasks. Um, um, uh, uh, showed us that there are about 28 regions out of the 180 regions which were um, uh, involved in each of these three tasks. Right? Um, and within these 28 regions, we're able to identify a core of 10 regions which were most strongly activated consistently across Two, uh, at least two of the three tasks. And then we, we each of these subjects had uh, about one hour of resting state data. So we um, wondered about how the connectivity uh, patterns looked like. And what we found was quite uh, confirming this, this uh, division of core versus non-core, or as we call them, penumbra regions. So the core regions were uh, more strongly connected with each other, more so than their connections to the uh, penumbra regions, and more so than the con average connections of other uh, brain regions with each other. So what these results tell us is that there is this uh, cortical white system that seems to be tightly integrated together that is involved in multiple cognitive tasks. And um, we also um, discovered that this system is not just limited to the cortex, but also is present in the subcortex. So there are specific um, multiple demand regions present in the caudate uh, and also present in the cerebellum, um, spe specifically in crosses one and two. Um, and when we looked at resting state data, uh, we also asked the question which of these voxels uh, correlates most with the core um, MD regions um, um, more, than, more so than other brain regions. And we indeed again found the caudate and we found the same regions in the cerebellum. But we also found some hotspots in the uh, anterior thalamus um, and the putamen. Uh, so what this tells us again is that this system is not just related to the cortex, it seems to be a brain-wide system that is again tightly connected um, and confirms that the, these core regions are, are, have a special status in, the, in, in this system. So what about um, uh, functional specializations, what, what anatomists have been claiming uh, there should be more domain specificity rather than domain generality in the uh, association cortices. Um, so by definition, these 28 regions um, are each activated in, in each of these three tasks. And here I colored uh, these regions with their uh, preferences um, to, uh, or uh, the strength of their activity to one task over the other, um, three, uh, over the other two. And for example, more reddish regions are involved, uh, have a preference for the working memory task, more bluish regions have a preference for math, and more greenish regions have a preference for the reasoning task. And the, so what this uh, tells us is that um, functional preferences are not absolute, uh, they are relative. Um, and the only reason we could make this claim is because of the number of subjects we've had. So we had 400 plus subjects. And if you split those subjects into two groups, 200 and 200, um, every little dip in, uh, and change and preference for the task um, is um, uh, closely replicated by the other group. The, the lines are almost identical and the correlations were over 0.9. Um, so we had a very high statistical power to be able to detect that these preferences are, are, are relative and not really absolute. So based on these results, we developed this um, uh, framework uh, to try and understand this idea of co-activation but also relative functional preferences. So we think that relative functional preferences will emerge because um, each multiple man region, which is depicted here in different colors, um, um, has uh, uh, access to a limited type of uh, information owing to its uh, different local connectivity in the brain. Uh, so some regions might have, for example, access to the, to the stimulus you're looking at, but some regions might have more access to the uh, action you're about to perform, for example. Um, but because we know that this, these regions are tightly integrated and they, uh, they, they communicate with each other, then this also gives rise to the co-activation uh, pattern. So we, we defined this system 
uh, based on three tasks. So we were like, okay, we need to expand that range of tasks. Um, um, so we decided to collect our own data using these uh, HTTP methods at the, at the CBU. And we decided to use um, um, four tasks that were related to the uh, executive function. And um, these are the uh, results. So um, we, we were quite surprised but also very happy that we were able to replicate these same nine patches just using 37 subjects um, um, versus uh, the 400 plus subjects from the HTTP data set. So talk about really good fMRI methods here, right? And the four tasks we used um, were, um, uh, again, an NBAC task. So this was a sanity check for us that we we're going to get the same results. But here we also added an auditory version. And the NBAC task was a, a three-back versus one-back task. Uh, we also had a, a rule switching task. So participants were solving blocks where um, uh, they had to use two rules versus blocks where they had to use one rule. And the stop signal task, um, um, where they, there were blocks that the stop signal randomly appeared versus blocks where there was no stop signal. Um, but we know that uh, averaging these four tasks can be misleading. So is there a, a, a common component across all of these tasks? Um, um, so we looked at the single subject level, and this is indeed what we found. Um, so we asked whether each vertex in the cortex um, was statistically significant within a single subject for all of these four tasks. And then we created an overlap map of the subjects. And as you can see, there is um, the overlap is quite good um, in relation to the extended MD regions we defined. But you, you can also notice that uh, there are lots of, uh, there are regions where the overlap um, um, is quite good, but there are also regions where the overlap is quite poor. Uh, for example, this temporal patch. And this will become important later in, in, the, in the talk. So what about uh, functional preferences? Um, so here I colored each vertex, not just each area, with its preference for each of the uh, uh, tasks. And um, again, you see a mosaic of functional preferences. And there is a lot to unpack here. Uh, and this is what I'll try to do over the next uh, few slides. Um, but first, I'd like you to um, believe, make you believe in the strength of, of, of the localization of this data that these uh, small shifts in colors are actually meaningful, which are just few millimeters apart in the brain. Um, so to make you believe that, I'll ask you a question. So you remember we, we acquired the NBAC data uh, once using uh, visual and once using auditory stimuli. And the same subjects did the both tasks on um, two different sessions. Can you tell me which of these brains is visual and which one is auditory? Any answers? So they, they look quite strikingly similar, right? Which, um, yeah, when, I, when, I, when um, uh, we first showed this data to, to John, he thought we did something wrong with the analysis. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Uh, so he had, uh, had us go back and repeat the analysis for like a, a few times to just to make sure that this was true. Um, so talk about solving the re replication problem in fMRI, right? Uh, this this, this uh, data is quite strong and striking. And this is not just at the group level. Even at the single subject level, uh, we found very strong correlations between, between these two tasks. So what I want you to take away from this slide is that every little shift in activation I'm going to show you in the next slide is going to be statistically significant, is neurobiologically important and needs to be interpreted. So now let's focus on uh, one of the regions, uh, a region uh, in the lateral prefrontal cortex called P946V. And uh, here I colored the vertices with the preferences for uh, each of the three tasks. Um, and then I placed seeds uh, manually, just three seeds, uh, approximately along where the colors start to shift. And then I used an independent resting state data set, the ACP data set, so completely independent from the data we've acquired. And I looked at the connectivity maps of these seeds. So this is how the uh, connectivity map of seed number one looks like. And hopefully you can see that it's, um, it's, this seed is more connected to regions that are uh, along this black border, uh, both in the frontal and the uh, parietal lobe. 
And this is the connectivity map for seed number two. So hopefully you can appreciate that compared to seed number one, the connectivity has shifted slightly more posteriorly, both in frontal and parietal regions. And this is seed number three, with, and, and hopefully you can again see that the connectivity is, is shifting even more posteriorly in, in, in both frontal and parietal regions. So how does this compare to the, to the task activations we got? Um, so if you look at the map of seed number one and the stop signal um, task activations, they look quite similar. So the, the stop signal seems to have activity along the same border that uh, seed number one is mostly connected to, both in the frontal and the parietal lobes. And the activations for the NBAC seem to shift slightly backwards compared to the stop signal, similar to what seed number two has shown. And again, the switch activations seem to shift even more backwards, similar to what seed number three shows. So this tells us that even within a single multiple band region, there are some shifts, uh, um, finer grained uh, um, resting state architecture here. And this resting state architecture must be related to these relative functional preferences, to these relative domain specificities we find in the, in, in the brain. Um, so um, to do this in a more um, automatic way, instead of me placing seeds, uh, we, um, we, look, we asked the question of how each seed in the brain is, uh, uh, which of these three tasks is it more correlated with? Um, and uh, this is the map we get, uh, which is just repeating what I've told you, but across the whole brain. And we also tried to penalize ourselves by excluding the surrounding vertices, because we know local connectivity seems um, uh, um, regions nearby each other seem to have the same connectivity. And hopefully you can see that um, um, the same patterns here, that the, the, there is blue and then more posteriorly it's red and then more posteriorly it's green. And similarly here in the parietal lobe that there is blue, red and green. So are these connectivity shifts random or do they relate to what we know in the literature about resting state networks? And here I colored um, um, uh, uh, some of the resting state networks with the same colors, hopefully to show you that they are similar, that the blue regions lie in similar locations, the green regions lie in similar locations here as well, and the red regions lie in similar loca locations here. Um, and uh, the, the resting state networks obviously are a much more coarser way of looking at these things, but they are, they are still relevant. So what about task activations? Um, how do these tasks overlap with the resting state networks? So the um, FPN here stands for the front operator network, and we found that the core MD forms a, a, a subset of these uh, front operator regions, and we found that uh, all four tasks activate the front operator network, whether it's core or non-core, um, um, quite similarly. But then things start to get more interesting as you move into other resting state networks, like the DAN here in green, which is the dorsal attention network. So it seems that switch uh, activates uh, it more strongly than all of the other three tasks. Um, the stop signal seems to activate the single opercular network more than the other um, three tasks, and uh, the DMN seems to act, uh, seems to be the least to activate uh, to deactivate the uh, uh, to be deactivated by the NBAC task. Um, so there you go, uh, the DMN, which is usually involved in internally generated thoughts, being involved in a complex task like the NBAC one. So it's not really passive when you're doing complex cognitive operations. But also for free here, we got uh, two interesting results uh, that um, answer a couple of uh, gaps in the literature that the switch task through switching seems to be more left hemisphere than right hemisphere, and the uh, stop signal uh, seems to be more right hemisphere than left hemisphere. So what, this, uh, what I want you to take away from this slide is that it seems that um, each of these tasks is a combination of activating MD regions, but also activating some more specialized resting state networks in the, in the brain. Right? So here I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on one of those tasks, like the stop signal one, and the uh, green borders here show the uh, MD network, and the blue borders here show the single opercular network. And hopefully you can appreciate that the activations in that task lie exactly at the border between these two networks. Um, so it's a combination, so stop signal is a combination of activating both the MD and the single opercular network, for example. 
But we were quite intrigued by these border activations. I, I was quite excited about it because why should the activations lie exactly at the border? You know, ma maybe it should have activated both networks fully, but why should it be exactly at the border here? And we wondered whether this is just an artifact of uh, these group average maps or not. So we did the same analysis. We asked, okay, where are, where are the uh, top 5% uh, vertices uh, for each task, for each single subject located? And we created this probabilistic overlap map. And it, the bright red uh, uh, dots here, the vertices, show you that for each task, the strongest activations, the top 5% activations, were mostly located at the borders, at the multiple demand borders. So this was quite exciting. This is a new level of how we can look and start to make, uh, get some mechanistic insights of um, these complex and um, cognitive task activations. And, um, um, we, we wondered, okay, are these tasks just activating um, all of the borders or do the borders also have something to do with um, uh, the relative function preferences? And indeed what we found is that the activations don't just peak at all of the borders, they peak at the task relevant borders. Um, so um, more, um, hopefully you can see here that the um, uh, act peaks that are in, uh, along these borders are in the same location as the switch task. The, for example, here the activations that are in, in blue, the border activations are in the same locations as the stop task, and the border activations in red here are in the same locations as the end back task. So we're quite excited about, about these findings, and we decided to do a, 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 a follow-up study uh, well, with a new hypothesis of um, how brain activations would look like in different tasks. Um, so this is a blown up picture of um, at the uh, intraparietal sulcus, so the, 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 the yellow areas are the core MD regions and the surrounding colored areas um, um, uh, belong to the different um, resting state networks. And the experiment we're running now um, hypothesizes that based on the task, the activity in, in the brain is going to creep in uh, from different directions. So if you use a more spatial task, it's going to creep in from that dorsal attention network direction. If you use a more language task, it's going to creep in from towards the language network. For example, if you use a theory of mind or an episodic memory task, it's going to creep in from the default mode network. And similarly, if you use a salience task, it's going to creep in from the single opercular network. So um, um, uh, uh, there's a PhD student in our lab, Gavin Shields, who is running this experiment now who um, John and I are co-supervising and um, um, we have some preliminary results that confirm this. I don't have time to show it to you but uh, um, hopefully he can come and present these results in another um, EPS meeting. Um, so before um, I summarize this talk I just want to um, acknowledge the um, um, all of the people who have helped me um, along the way. Um, so um, the HCP team, uh, mostly uh, specifically uh, Matt Glasser and David Van Essen, um, who are based at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, at the CBU, um, this guy who uh, probably none of you know about, uh, John Duncan, who's uh, uh, a great supervisor and mentor and a uh, friend. I think uh, Matthew Mack mentioned yesterday uh, an Olympics for the best supervisors. I think you'd be a very strong contender for the gold medal. <laughs> Um, Sneha Shashidara, who was a PhD student at the time when we collected the data. Uh, we basically took over the MRI scanner for four months, doing 100 sessions to collect this data at the CBU. Uh, um, and the MRI methods and IT teams who helped to set up these uh, complex MRI sequences and the requirements to do these uh, analysis. I'd also like to thank the Cambridge Trust uh, uh, and the Yusuf Jamil Scholarship for their PhD funding. And and um, my PhD examiners, uh, Alexander Woolgar, who is the internal at CBU, and um, Roger Mars at Oxford, whose letter of support uh, must have uh, played a role in uh, me getting the prize today. Um, so, um, to summarize, how, how, how might the um, brain activity assemble cognition. So this is a, a flattened picture of one of the activations in uh, in the in the hem in one of the hemispheres, um, just like you flatten an Earth map. Um, 
So what I've shown you today is that there is a tightly connected brain-wide system. It's a cortical, subcortical, and cerebellar, so it's uh, present all over the brain, that is activated in multiple diverse cognitive tasks. But it also has relative, but not absolute, functional preferences. Right? That uh, cognitive task activations will tend to be a mixture of activating this uh, domain general uh, system, but also will activate the surrounding specialized regions. Um, and these activations will shift in very specific ways, you know, following fine grained resting state architecture. And that um, the, the activation peaks at the borders between these domain general and, and the task relevant domain specific regions um, um, might be playing a critical role in integrating the different information needed for each of the different tasks. And thank you for that. You're listening. Another amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, and I can't believe that was a PhD. Uh, <laughs> uh, Thank really, you, you know, even I can see the how this moves us along in trying to understand the relationship between brain and behavior. Um, and I'm sure colleagues really appreciated this. Can I ask colleagues for questions? Uh, we we know that we want to be ruthless. That's what we've been told. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? Yeah, Claire. I'm slightly intimidated to ask a question. I don't Yeah, yeah, definitely there are individual differences and uh, in, in, in my master thesis I looked at actually how these individual differences in activations uh, correlate with IQ. And it's quite a complex, thorny topic because there isn't enough data in the literature to, to, to say something about it. But we, what we really think right now is, um, and someone needs to do this experiment, but from the different bits and pieces in the literature that if you have an easy task, you're going to have a weaker activation. And then as you get a harder task, you get stronger activation. And then people who have IQ scores are going to show a stronger um, increase or difference between um, the hard and the easy activations. But if the task is too difficult, then and suddenly people probably give up and then you find a, a drop in activation. Um, and th there, is, there is some new data that we looked at the, uh, in, the, in the HCP data set. Uh, there, uh, there was a summer intern who um, looked at um, um, the precise anatomy of where these activations are. And we discovered that there's a subset of subject probably 5% or something, who sometimes don't even have any activation, don't have any uh, uh, specific MD regions in that location. So this is quite, we don't, we don't really know what these, what, why these activations disappear. And it's not just that the activation disappeared, that cortical area doesn't exist. And we don't know why. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's still uh, undergoing. Um, but these, they, they don't seem to have any differences in their IQ scores in, in, their, in, their, um, in, in any of the sort of behavioral measures. So we're quite baffled. But we, uh, there might be some compensatory mechanisms. I don't know. Uh, but, but yes, there are indeed some individual differences. Though the locations of these activations are, when you use the appropriate methods to, to define them, then they are quite consistent. More or less every participant is going to have activity in these nine patches. Thank you so much. Yeah, OK, next. We have a question from online. This okay. is from Carolyn Patterson, who says, I realize that this is not a question with a quick answer, but can you say anything about the consequences of damage to different components of the network? Uh, yeah, so what we know 
is um, the more damage you get from the, uh, in the, uh, the, the more the damage overlaps from the, uh, with, with the MD regions, uh, you're going to lose lots of IQ points. So the, the behavior of the patient becomes more and more uh, disorganized. Um, whether there are uh, specific um, functions that suffer more than others, uh, potentially, given the, what I've just mentioned, that each MD region is, um, 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 have um, access to specific um, um, information in the, in, in the brain. Um, but I don't think there's enough data in the literature to, um, with enough damaged participants to, to say something about this. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, Alex Wolger had a paper uh, a few years ago where um, she looked at um, um, what happens to the system when parts of it are damaged. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's either that the system showed stronger activations or had stronger connectivity. It's one of those. Um, but I'm sure they are related anyways because activity and connectivity are related. Um, so it seems that perhaps you also get some sort of compensatory mechanism that these remaining MD regions start to become more and more integrated with each other, which is also what we find in these um, uh, uh, subjects in the Human Connectome Project where they don't have a specific cortical uh, area. So we find that the activity and the connectivity of the MD system as a whole starts to slightly increase. I hope that answers the question. Okay. two questions. Uh, and the first one is, is quite simple. So in, uh, I don't know how the HCP uh, defines the boundaries in its parcellation, but the, the anatomical and cytoarchitectonic approach typically shows that you get sort of very gradual transitions in the, the thickness of a cortical layer or the um, uh, presence of a particular kind of cell, not, not a sharp organ. So in, in that kind of anatomy, and your anatomy, they talk about gradients rather than so, so that's the first question. I'd just like to comment on that. Oops. Oh, I, can I? Oh, I wanted to show you a slide to answer yes, that question. Okay. But I, I'll, I'll still share the screen, OK? I had to skip over that because of the time. Sorry. Hopefully, I can find it. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is an example of how they um, defined, for example, one of the areas. So this is a myelin map, and you can get this by getting the ratio of the T1 with the T2 scan. Um, and for example, if you focus on this area, which is 55B, you can see that, for example, it has less myelin content than the surrounding regions. Um, and then you can also see that it's uh, strongly and selectively activated in one of the um, fMRI tasks in the HCP dataset, which was the language task. Um, and also you can see that if you place seeds um, um, in different regions of the brain, it does have a, a very specific specific and unique connectivity pattern, um, um, which is different than the, 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 the region surrounding it. And also you can see that the cortical thickness here, uh, it's slightly more thick than the region surrounding it. And the way you would define the borders then is you take the a gradient measure, so like the first spatial derivative of, of these maps, and then where the signal starts to suddenly shift, that's where you draw the border. Um, but they didn't stop at that, so they, they did a heroic work of also going back as much as they can find um, uh, in historical site to architectonic studies. And for example, this is a, a study where they found that this area was identified in a very early myelin map. And, and all of these consistent features then tell you that, okay, this is a, a, a patch of the cortex that is different than its surrounding patches. Um, and I, we're, yeah, your question about uh, large cortical gradients. Um, so that, that, yeah. So that, that there, there seems to be in, from what I've shown, is that there are some fine cortical gradients that are some very specific ones that seem to lie within the bigger hierarchy of these bigger cortical gradients. Does that answer your question? Okay. okay. And we had one at the front. 
Um, is there anything in your data that can speak to how the connectivity is coordinated? So um, you showed this uh, this really cool data about how when people are doing one task versus another task, you're getting the activation on one border versus another border. Um, I mean, for example, is that a bottom-up process of the more domain-specific area kind of gaining control on the input to the domain general area, or is it the domain general area seeking out the information it wants in a more top-down way? Yeah. Um, I feel hesitant to answer that question using fMRI data because <laughs> the, the information exchange must be happening like that. You know, you, you need you need electrophysiology uh, to, to be able to tell you where information is, is is going within a few milliseconds. But what I can tell you is that uh, when when uh, I did an FIR model, so like looking at um, uh, um, point, time point by time point of where the activation goes, it seemed to be spreading from the domain specific towards the domain general areas. Whether this is truly what's happening or just an artifact of the slow time course of fMRI, I, I don't know. But perhaps it suggests that domain specific regions start to be activated and then they start recruiting MD regions when they start to struggle with the task at hand, for example, or when they want to communicate uh, and build that cognitive computational structure uh, to solve the task at hand. Last question is Patrick. Can I ask a, a more speculative question? So I'm very interested by the idea that for cognition to work well, you want to have a multiple demand system which is surrounded by the different attentional networks which and, and the activity across the boundary is then part of how cognition works. But um, in topology, there's a long tradition of op op optimal topology. What's the best way to, to produce topology? So if you have a multiple demand system here, uh, how many different attentional networks could it be surrounded by? Uh, and in principle, if each attentional network was a tiny, tiny focal activation, it could be surrounded by many. And, and uh, but there are reasons why the different attentional networks need a certain critical mass. So I'm just interested that in your data, you're getting the attentional networks from the resting state fMRI analyses that we have historically, I think, for the literature. And there were about four that you talked about. And you, you showed very convincingly that you can have a multiple demand system which can have a common boundary with about four different types of cognitive attention network. And I just wonder, what, is, is that optimal? I mean, could there be more than four? Can we really rely on the resting state fMRI uh, connectivity data to tell us that there are four basic kinds of types of transmission? Could you, could you produce different cognitive systems where you had many more smaller domain general things clustered around the, uh, the, the multiple demand system. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment a little bit on, on the number of cognitive subtypes that your work wants to I can, I can show you actually some data, not just comment, um, that I also skipped. Um, sorry if I'm over time. Um, where did I put it? Yeah, so <clears throat> I definitely think things are more finer grained than the four networks I've shown. And you can even find these finer grained results um, using, um, uh, using resting state fMRI. So the, the, the way people just cluster these networks, the algorithms just build a, 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 these coarse sort of networks. But they are not the finer, say, there are definitely more finer grained ones. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, for example, in the anterior insula. Um, well, I, I'll tell you about this first, and then I'll show you the anterior insula one. Um, so this is, this is, for example, a finding uh, of how more finer grained um, uh, domain-specific regions always lie next to the MD regions. Um, uh, so Federenko in 2012 showed that uh, the language and MD regions lie next to each other within the Broca's area. So the, the red regions here, oh, sorry, the people on the... I'd use the pointer. So the red regions here are the language regions, and the blue regions here are the multiple demand regions. And you can see they're quite next to each other. Uh, we've also shown in this uh, sensory modality experiment when you contrast the visual versus auditory uh, maps um, in the easy versus fixed contrast that the strongest sensory modality differences, which are here the strong reddish and bluish colors, are right next to, in this C sort of C-shaped arrangement, are right next to these MD regions. And you can see, for example, one of these um, 
pulses here, which in the resting state network is classified as part of the front parietal network. But you can see that uh, the, within that parcel, there are two split regions. One is which is more visual and one which is more auditory here. So things are much, much more finer grained. And what I didn't mention also is that the the tasks we used, some of the blocks were, had face stimuli and some of them had house stimuli. So if you contrast these to, to look at where face patches and house patches might be present, um, so the stronger yellowish regions are fa fa more uh, face-related patches and the bluish regions are more house. And again, you can see how they are quite um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the vicinity of these MD regions. And actually, if you put a dot here, it's right in between these blue and, uh, and reddish regions. So this is the sort of new level of precision of saying, okay, within that parcel, you can actually find three functional areas, one visual, one facial, one, one auditory, for example. Um, and yeah. And then the, the interior insula, like, look at this, for example, like, what, what is this? We, we don't really know how to interpret it, but this is one region which, look here, it just has one color, you know, the, the, the yellow color belongs to the front parietal network, but what we find is that, oh, you can divide it into actually three even subdivisions, three functional subdivisions, and I have no idea why it's arranged in that way, but that's, uh, that means uh, I still have a lot of experiments to do. <laughs> Okay. Any more questions, colleagues? Yeah. Um, I was, I've been. I understand a bit about um, emotion and the cognitive psychology of emotion. And uh, Lisa Barrett talks about degeneracy, the idea that um, the same sort of signals can be carried through different neurons. And I just wondered how that maps onto your sort of very specific. Um, brain region functions networks. So I, was, I just wondered what you'd say if I asked you how, how does the idea of degeneracy fit with this stuff? Hmm. I don't really have a, a, a good answer. Everything's got to be speculative. Um, but Again, if you have certain regions which are more domain-specific related to uh, uh, emotional responses, for example, then what I would expect from our framework is that um, these regions, if they are involved in a complex cognitive operation or a complex cognitive task, are going to um, uh, be communicating. They have to be communicating with um, um, some of the MD regions at least, and probably they will be communicating with the MD regions that are closest to them um, because of the relative functional preferences um, so that they can be integrated, their information can be integrated in the overall cognitive structure of whatever the emotional task they, they are doing uh, um, is, is addressing. Does that maybe answer your question? I think about it, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I suggest that we bring this session to a close and uh, thank our speaker again for just a fabulous, adventurous talk. Uh, really, really enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.